Hey guys, so today's video is going to be on the EG4 3000 watt inverter. So I had another uh, intro that I recorded before this, but I thought if everyone got bored, they weren't going to go all the way through the video to know my thoughts on the inverter. Um, I've been having a lot of fun with this little inverter. So I put it through some pretty serious load tests and it's a tough little inverter. So I'm going to give you my thoughts. I guess I'll give the stats first. So it's a 3000 watt single phase inverter. It can take in 5000 watts of solar. It can charge at 80 amps, which is going to be over 4000 watts, which is uh, pretty impressive for its size. And then another unique thing, it can take in 500 volts open circuit. So if you're wiring in your solar to this, uh, it's extremely easy uh, because of the high voltage range on it. So uh, that makes things a whole lot easier if you're in cold weather, especially. But yeah, just wiring in general, putting your PV into this, putting your solar into this, a whole lot easier. Also, you can expand these units. So it can go up to 16, I believe, in parallel. So <laughs> that's pretty incredible. But with two of them, you get split phase, um, which is e extremely helpful. Um, and so it's nice to have options for expansion. I would consider this inverter great for beginners. So as far as installation, and you'll see it as I go through it, I'm going to do some of that here. Uh, I'll put some load testing in at the end. Um, but the case, when you open the case, everything's sealed off as opposed to some of the other inverters I've worked on. So it's very uh, beginner friendly. Everything's labeled. Uh, the manual did a good job of explaining battery communication, uh, what to hook up. So performance wise, it's done well so far as I've been testing it. Uh, it's quiet. It's actually on right now. I do have my mic, so that cancels some noise, but all you can hear is some light, really light fan noise. So it will uh, obviously speed up when you have solar going to it or you're using a heavy load, but it's a pretty quiet little inverter. So that's a good segue into use cases. So an RV, I could picture people using this in a small RV or a shed, an outdoor shed, a, uh, a horse barn, something where they needed lights or they had a fridge. This is fantastic for that, especially for the price, especially the fact that it comes with most everything you'd need to get started other than the battery and the actual solar panels. Also for a critical loads panel, I really, I think this would be great for a small off-grid cabin or uh, to run a critical loads panel in a house. So that's the probably, it, I can picture probably one of the most useful things you could do with it is have this as, again, an entry level inverter that you could expand on if you wanted. But uh, to keep your fridges fresh during a storm, uh, your lights, your Starlink, whatever you've got, um, there's plenty of power here to run the fridges, freezers, everything, and keep them sustained. So the biggest thing with that would probably be because of the cost of this is so low. It's just going to be how many batteries you can put with it. And again, you can expand those too. So with one battery and this inverter, you could keep you know, some fridges going for quite some time. It really, it would be tough to actually pin down the number of fridges. And exact, it would depend on the exact appliance you have. But I can picture this being really good for that. So some of this install is going to be talking about the load center I have here. Right now I have it set up in off-grid. But... I'm going to tag a video uh, where uh, an electrician talks about how to create a critical loads panel. To me, I mean, because of its size, you could pretty much jam it in anywhere. Because of the fact that it's quiet, uh, you can tuck it into a corner somewhere in your house and it's not going to irritate you. All right. And so it comes with the breaker, the DIN rail and the cabling here for the inverter. Cool. A couple different communication cables here. Some of them are probably paralleling cables also. All right. That is the Wi-Fi dongle looks like for remote monitoring. course I would do it upside down. <laughs> okay. Cool. That is a neat little unit. Um, 
What's amazing is it's so small when I've been used to dealing with the 18K. And it's light too, not a lot to it. So looking at your inverter at the bottom, we have the AC in, AC output. This is where your solar would come in. This is the PV input. This is a grounding screw, an input breaker for the AC input. This is the RS-232 communications cable, or port, sorry, RS-485. This is a dry contact port. It's the on-off switch, and this is where your positive and negative battery cables would go in. So now that I have the cover off, you can see they kept it pretty simple. It's pretty clean in here. So this is the input. So this would either be coming from the generator or if you have grid, this would come from the grid for bypass. This is the input ground. There's the hot leg, then neutral. Then output, your hot leg, your neutral. And over here we have the PV. PV positive and negative. So this is where the solar would come in. And over here, I'll show you here in a second, but there's a shield in the way, but they left these two holes here so you could tighten the terminals for the battery input the two cables there so they insert from the bottom and you use these two holes here to tighten the terminals on the inside so yeah you can just make out the terminals on the inside there all right so i already put two screws in here for mounting it so i'm going to lift it up here and put it on the wall So yeah, this is the kit that came with it. So this is the battery cable. This is the Nader breaker. So in order to mount it onto a wall, they sent this rail here. Well, I actually have a small piece from another installation I did. So uh, anyway, that's just to get it onto the wall. The cable itself, so this is where it's going to vary a little bit. I have two bus bars here set up, and that's just because I'm going to be using this wall for testing. So these are going to stay permanently from a small battery bank that I have. Uh, but normally these cables could go directly down to one batteries or two batteries for this inverter, three batteries, whatever you wanted. Um, and I can show you the small battery cabinet I have. It could go down to that. But yeah, you don't need these bus bars. You do need the breaker they sent and of course the cable. So my bus bars have 3 8 studs on them and these are 5 16 So I'm going to have to put some new heads on these wires. So I have another crimper, but just for the sake of simplicity, I can put this in the link below. This is a hammer crimper. Temco actually makes really good stuff. So if you see anything Temco on Amazon, it's usually pretty good. So these are extremely simple. I've done a lot of my installations with a hammer crimper. Um, but this does 4 gauge, which is what this is all the way up to 4 aught, which is a, a massive fat cable. <laughs> so it's pretty universal. They're extremely easy to use. And I'll show you how I crimp this 4, yeah, this is a 4 gauge. Yeah, I'll show you how I crimp this 4 gauge here in just a second. So you will slide this on there, and then you'll see the hammer crimper has a little notch right there. And this would sit in the notch. So you can actually let the crimper hold the lug if it makes it easier. Sometimes with the larger gauges, it makes it a little harder. You got one stray hair there. but So this would go in there like that. And then that's pretty much it. You lay it down flat on a good surface, nice solid surface. And when you hammer it, it punches in a little uh, indentation and cups around the lug and crimps it tight. But for a cheap option, to get a small system up and running, these are really good. And you can see there, it made a nice little indentation, and the bottom is cupped in or pressed in. So it, that's a good tight lug. It won't come off. Now it just needs heat shrink. You guys are getting to see how dirty my shop floor is. So let me get it in front of the camera there. So that's about it. Right up to the neck, but not onto the flat face of the lug. And 
and that's it. So you have a nice seal. It looks nice. This actually, this heat shrink here is pretty decent. So it has that glue in it, which I prefer. I like to see it squeeze out the edges. So yeah, it's a kind of a important fact is that there's always going to be something that comes up. It may not be major, but there's always going to be something that happens during the installation. And you may not have, I happen to have those lugs here on hand. So you may not have them on hand. You may not have whatever it is on hand, but if it's an extra day or two or whatever it takes uh, to wait for that item, uh, just be patient and do it. I know it's hard. If you're like me, you want to see it up and running as soon as you have it and you're able. But things happen. So the best thing you could do is try to let it be a lesson in patience, I guess. <laughs> Nearly impossible to make it out with the glare. I checked to make sure, but there's continuity between the ground there, you see on the left, the terminal, and the one on the case down below. So this one was easier for me to hook up to here, cleaner. But if you're supplying power from the grid, you'll be using uh, that ground anyway, or if you're doing like I am and, and hooking in an off-grid setting, again, you can still use that terminal all the way on the left, the grounding terminal. everything off while you're doing all this that should go without saying uh, but I think I guess most things need to be said now but yeah the the solar is gonna be off when you wire it in so you're gonna need a disconnect or you're not gonna connect your solar beforehand you really need a disconnect in the solar line there for safety reasons but either way yeah you're not gonna do anything with the solar the PV while the PV's on, battery, or your grid is on. So you're not doing anything on this unit. It's not gonna be open. So don't mess with any live wires. Uh, you know, I would say don't do anything dumb, but you know, nowadays people don't necessarily know what dumb is. So <laughs> don't, uh, don't do anything that's not safe. Make sure everything's off. So I'm gonna try to keep this as beginner friendly as possible. So this is, where the inverter power is coming into. I used 10 gauge wire, which if you look at the manual, that's what it recommends. So 10-2, if you're gonna get solid wire for this, you can get 10-2 from a big box store. And depending on how close your box is to the inverter, you're not gonna need that much. Or you can get it in individual strands there also, 10 gauge wire. But you have, again, you have one hot, a neutral, and a ground. So a 10-2 would work for that. Also, because this is a off-grid panel, I have the ground and the neutral combined. So I'm trying to, again, trying not to confuse people that aren't aware of this. But in an off-grid setting, you would combine those two, the ground and neutral. If you were on grid, if you were supplying grid power to the unit, or if the grid was hooked up, that already has that taken care of. So you would just hook up to the hot. So I prefer to have this breaker here. This is a 30 amp breaker. I prefer to have a means of disconnect. I could just hook this into the lug right there, but I like to be able to shut the power off to the panel in case I needed to work on the panel. So that way, the only thing, if you didn't shut the inverter off, that is, the only thing that would be hot is that lug right there, this wire. So here's two other circuits on here. So I have two 20 amp circuits running to receptacles down below for testing. And that's basically it. If somebody wanted 
to have this uh, in a, a home, if you were going to run a small panel in a home for your microwave or fridges or whatever, it wouldn't have to be this big. So you could have a, a smaller load center. It just depend, depends. It's probably better to plan ahead for future expansion. So get something where you can get enough breakers in to where you may expand if you add a second inverter. Also, another advantage that I don't know if I mentioned already is as it's running these circuits, these critical load circuits in your house, if you have it hooked up into your house, you're not going to be paying electric on that. So as you run your microwave, your fridges, uh, it's neat knowing that that, that is free. <laughs> so I'm going to be plugging the battery cable here there so this is battery communication and the inverter came with two cables that look the same so here's the one i'm going to be using and these are the eg4ll models if you're going to be using the budget models uh, there's a different way you would put these pins here but it's all in the manual so you can just look it up uh, and then it would plug in right here and then it'll be able to communicate with the inverter. All right, so now that everything is hooked up, we're it's ready to turn the breakers on to the batteries. So I have the breaker on over there underneath the inverter, and then I'm going to switch on the battery here, and it has a pre-charge resistor built in. So that'll make sure that nothing is harmed in the inverter itself from an inrush of current from the battery. So Again, this is going to be different in the budget models. They don't have a BMS switch. They just have a main breaker switch. So it's going to initialize the BMS. And then I'll turn this on here. So it's charging up the capacitors in the inverter. And we should be good to turn it on. All right, I'm going to switch the switch down below. And we are on. So it's got full batteries, really no load on it. It's outputting 120 volt. So I've set it here to where we can do a load test on it. I turned the volume off too because I can't stand the beeping. So we've got zero load on it right now. And I'm going to be doing some load testing here in just a second. Let's start with a shop vac first. All right, so that's the shop vac. We're up to a thousand something watts. Now let's turn the compressor on. So I have a smaller pancake compressor, but still, it does still surge. So that handled that fine. So now. Let's turn a heat gun on. That should be 1500 watts. So that should exceed what we can do. Let's go on low first. All right, let's try high because we're still not there. Yeah, 3.6, well over 3000 watts. There she goes. Yeah, it can take it though. So I haven't even looked at the manual to see what the auto restart on that is. It may do it itself. Let's see. Yep. Restarted. All the loads out there started again, except for the heat gun. Let me try putting the other loads and then starting the compressor because that's such a huge surge. Here, we'll put the heat gun all the way on. So that's 2,500 watts right now. Now let's see if it can start the compressor with that too, because that's the real surge. It did it too. It did it. That is really cool. So let's turn the heat gun off so it doesn't kill it. Here we go. Yeah, so it can handle a good surge for such a small unit. So that should be able to, you know, if people if people have something, like I was saying, like a microwave or something that's starting up 
or I don't know what it's going to be hooked into. If it's a vacuum, whatever, it'll be able to handle that initial surge. Well, that's going to about wrap this one up, guys. It was actually fun. I like this little inverter. Uh, so feel free to leave any questions you have in the comment section, and I'll see if I can answer them. Uh, and I'll probably end up making a small or short follow-up video. I usually end up forgetting at least two or three things uh, every time I make a video, so I'll see if I can add them in the next one, whatever they are. Uh, and I'll put this inverter in the description down below also. Stay tuned.